All right, thank you, Steph. Much appreciated, and welcome everybody. Welcome to Upper Bound. I'm really excited to, to have everyone here with us uh, today and, and this week. Um, again, for those who haven't uh, who I haven't met before, uh, my name's Cam Linky. I'm the CEO here at Amy. Um, I'm excited to have you uh, out for this week and excited to be able to open the week. Um, so I'm going to talk about the, the future of AI here today, which um, you know is the, the title of a talk you can only agree to after a few glasses of wine, um, not before. Um, and maybe it seems like a kind of arrogant thing to, to um, have me talk about. Um, you know, we have some incredible researchers in our group. We have people out this week who are driving uh, policy for. We have people who are at the forefront of, of uh, AI and business. We have people at the forefront of AI and industry. Um, we have people who are at the forefront and students who are at the forefront of, of AI research. And uh, you know, for me to come up and, and say what the future of AI is, um, is, uh, is maybe a little bit of an arrogant thing to talk about. Um, And that's why they won't let me talk about it. Uh, there we go. All right. Um, and you know, maybe I'm going to join a list of people um, or other predictions, uh, specifically in the AI and technology space, that have been um, you know quite wrong. And everything from wow, we're going to get this whole AI thing solved in uh, just a couple months, maybe just this uh, this summer, um, you know, which was you know prediction back in 1970, through to oh, this isn't going to be solved for decades. Uh, um, around the game of Go, and you know, was solved a, was solved a year later. Um, through to you know, again, whatever's going to come out of my mouth today. And perhaps I did not listen to um, what my parents told me growing up, which is uh, better to be silent and thought a fool than to speak up and remove all doubt. Um, but that's not what AI Week's about, and that's not what Upper Bound's about. Um, this week, we really hope that. Um, everybody is going to be ambitious in the conversations that they have, ambitious in um, sharing their ideas, sharing their thoughts, uh, in proposing paths to the future, and proposing what they see the future of AI is. Um, and through that, we're going to be able to get to a great place together. So I'm going to... Um, ignore this, this very good advice I was given uh, growing up um, and talk a little bit about um, what the future of AI um, is going to be and how we're going to get there. Um, but to start, let's talk a little bit about a few things that we're seeing um, right now, a few things that we're seeing uh, both important research-wise and things that we're seeing is really important uh, in the work that we're doing with industry and um, you know, important drivers of what's, what's going forward. So here's three quick predictions. Maybe everybody will feel like they, they make a lot of sense uh, to warm us up. And then um, at the end of this, then I'll, I'll tell you what I actually think the, the actual future of AI is uh, beyond, these, beyond these predictions. So the first one, maybe this seems really obvious to you, um, the data and machine learning partnership uh, train isn't stopping. That's continuing to drive going forward. Um, the second one, maybe this is a little bit, uh, a little bit surprising, maybe something that isn't talked about quite as much, but real-time learning is going to end up mattering, and uh, in the near future, um, is going to matter more and more. Um, and the third one that you know, I hope everybody agrees on, but maybe is is uh, you know a little bit. Of, uh, of a new prediction is, you know, AI is going to be everywhere. It's going to be the primary driver of, of economic success and primary driver of business success. Um, and the one prediction I can guarantee is that everything I say above, um, all, in some way, all of these three predictions are going to be wrong in some way. Um, but that's the exciting part about it and part of this week and what we get to explore this week. So let's dive into at least the three things that, that I've said. So the first one um, is the data and machine learning train is not stopping. This is, uh, um, this is a chart of the amount of data collected. This is actually from a few years ago, and we've exceeded all of this, um, the amount of data collected worldwide. And we are really in this phase of the datafication of everything. And whether it's a company like Wyvern um, that's here in Edmonton that's creating smaller and smaller, smaller satellites, they're able to capture richer and richer data 
um, around the uh, from space. Um, whether it's um, you know the scanning of the ocean, um, I think we're at the point where uh, we're going to have every fish in the ocean is going to be wearing a Fitbit here soon. Um, you know, if you're if you're um, and if you're out on whether it's a job site um, uh, in construction. Um, if you're in the hospital, everywhere that we go, we are seeing more and more data collected and richer and richer sensors capturing uh, more and more data along the way. And so what that's allowing us to do and what we've seen the rise of over the last little bit here um, is the combination of um, an extreme amount of new data collected uh, along with new architectures that allow us to do um, allow us to use that data um, and allow us to learn on that data uh, in a way that um, we, you know, we really weren't be able to, to do before. So um, for those of you who um, are, are machine learning fans, you'll recognize the thing, uh, you'll recognize the diagram on the left. For those of you who are less um, uh, deep into machine learning, you'll probably recognize, sorry, you'll recognize the thing on the left, the machine learning people, you'll recognize the thing on the right, and that's a transformer architecture. Um, and so the, the, um, the architecture on the right is what is driving things like large language models, is driving things like uh, stable diffusion and image generation, which is what generated the transformer on the left. Um, and what the really big part and the reason that this and the datafication of everything are continuing to drive out hand in hand is that it this architecture works extremely well on today's computers, today's GPUs. The computing systems that we have are able to, in parallel, leverage the continuing increase in data um, and are continuing to drive uh, predictions and continuing to drive uh, new opportunities off of that. And so whether it's things like what probably everybody's heard, and you might hear a little bit this week, chat GPT, uh, large language models, uh, we're seeing huge, obviously huge increases in the last, and huge improvements in the last couple of years around that. Um, you know, specifically in the last few months around it, but you're, we're seeing this grow into other areas. So an example is uh, AlphaFold and um, AlphaFold 2 specifically more recently leveraging the transformer architecture and leveraging uh, the ability to, uh, to compute data in parallel to be able to uh, make a vast leap forward in our ability to predict protein conformations. So now we're able to drive out new things in drug discovery. We're able to model the, the bio world in a way that we weren't before by better leveraging new data, more data, and more parallel architectures to do so. And we're seeing this drive out across everything. So this shouldn't be a surprise um, to anyone in the machine learning world, or it isn't, I don't think it is a surprise to anyone in the machine learning world, but you pick an area where we have an extreme and growing amount of data, and we're able to continual, uh, continually improve that as that data grows, and we're seeing this just proliferate everywhere, including areas like healthcare, as we're slowly uh, but surely able to unlock health data, uh, we're able to see new outcomes um, being driven in health, um, new predictions being able to be driven in health, um, improvements in the, in the healthcare system. So this is great. We have a lot of really big problems with a lot of really big data uh, in the world, and we're able to leverage um, this architecture uh, and the increased deification of things to be able to improve what we can do in that area. Okay, this is probably, this one feels maybe a little bit obvious um, to everyone, especially if you follow the news or, or uh, um, have been in machine learning or follow what's been going on in machine learning the last little bit. This one maybe is a little bit, um, this one maybe is a little bit different, a little bit more of a surprise. Um, so real-time learning, being able to adapt and adjust and learn in real time is going to matter more and more as we deploy more and more of these systems in the wild, as we specifically deploy um, uh, factories, uh, our uh, machine learning in factories, machine learning in, in places like robots, and one of our favorite, which is artificial limbs. So on the left,
left here, um, this, is the, uh, this is the hand, this is not quite the hand, but almost the hand that gave out a, a, a Juno at the Juno Awards here in Edmonton a few months ago. And this is research from being led out by Dr. Patrick Polarski, one of our fellows here at Amy, uh, in his lab at the University of Alberta. And Patrick does artificial limb research um, where he's trying to teach the, the limbs, or he's trying to allow limbs to be able to learn about the user of that limb and not have the user have to learn this as a brand new tool. So much like I use my arms and I wave my arms around, sometimes hit the mic, sorry. Um, I don't have to think about like twist the wrist now, close hand now. Um, my hands, in as much as I can control them, um, are, are a kind of natural partner to me. And Patrick and his team are working on algorithms to be able to continually improve that. But one of the things that you see when you start to deploy these things in the wild is that um, the, the world isn't necessarily your friend. And they, your sensors degrade, your motors get worse, or one breaks. Um, your, you know, your system overall is not getting the data that I was initially trained on. So we exist in this world that's continually training. We might be on the edge, uh, have an edge device that we can't store everything and retrain on it. And so the ability to update um, and improve um, based on what you're doing in context is going to become more and more important as we, as we drive forward. The last thing you want to do is have to pause and wait for your, if you have an artificial limb, pause and wait uh, for your limb to you know, download the latest update so it can start to work again. You want to be able to, to work with you and continue to grow and improve with you, um, you know, along the way. And for those of you who are um, you know, at the, at, uh, at Amy, if you're in Edmonton, if you kind of know, um, you know much about the research being done here, um, you'll probably recognize the context um, that uh, many of us think about this in, which is the reinforcement learning context, um, where you have an agent who's interacting in the world, um, they don't necessarily, they, they're not, they don't have a supervised data set to be able to learn from, but they're growing and learning um, through interaction and through taking actions in the world, they're, they're growing and learning over time. And so that framework is really the one that um, I think is going to be the biggest driver of deployable, um, uh, uh, deployable machine learning in context with things like robots, um, automated factories, and, and robotic limbs. And we're actually seeing the combination of these two things. Um, the, the one before with the amount of data improvement um, in, uh, in data or data systems, along with real-time learning. And this is work being done, so if you see on the bottom right there, um, work that, if you were here last year, you heard Martha White talk about. Um, and work being done out of Martha White and Adam White's lab on taking large amounts of training data, uh, large amounts of data um, from a water treatment plant, and learning off of that data, but not learning a model that's gonna be deployed in static in the wild. Instead, learning the best parameters for that system so that when deployed, that system can quickly learn and adapt as best as possible. And so um, these are the types of things where we're starting to see the combination, the overlap of the first one, which is you know, large amounts of data collection, the ability to pre-train systems really well, um, along with the deployment and the real-time update and real-time learning of these systems so that they're able to be robust um, in the wild. Okay, prediction two. Now prediction three. So the, the last one, and you know, hopefully with everybody here, maybe you came here because you were a big skeptic about, uh, about AI and uh, you weren't sure, um, but probably everybody in this room in some way um, you know, does believe that AI is going to be everywhere and really is going to affect uh, uh, every industry. And the prediction from my side is not that it's going to be every, that feels like an obvious one, but that we're going to be able to have better conversations around AI and more nuanced conversations around AI and what it means to have different AIs deployed in context. And it's going to allow us to have conversations that aren't 
Skynet AI conversations where we generalize AI as a term to everything and instead talk about these things in context. So we're going to see context, like I said, big data, big compute, uh, if you've heard the term foundation models, uh, where we do leverage that first thing, large data, large machine learning. Um, to be able to um, deploy these uh, very, very large systems using the amount of data that we have. The second one, as I mentioned, so online control-based systems uh, real, that are updating in real time, uh, but then continuing to talk about specialized and nuanced applications where more and more um, uh, techniques matter um, than just being able to say, okay, we have a large, uh, large amount of data, a large learning system. So example of this is uh, work being led in the Explainable AI Lab um, with Dr. Randy Gable and Dr. Osmar Zion, um, who are looking at how, um, how models that are deployed can be interpreted, interpretable and explainable so that they can be used in contexts where that matters a lot, where having uh, your model be able to uh, be interpretable, interpretable uh, matters a whole lot. So an example is the healthcare setting. You would like to know more about why a decision was made, um, or in drug discovery, you might want to know why or um, what the reason that you chose a specific molecule was, or why or why it didn't work. Um, and these specialized settings um, are going to, to matter a lot, and we're going to be able to have conversations about these, these settings uh, more specifically than just you know, AI as this, this broad topic overall. And so all these, okay, so these are three predictions that, you know, I don't know, maybe are, are a little unsatisfactory. Um, the one you know, big thing about this as we, as we grow is that there really is no better time uh, to be in AI, and the combination of those three things I mentioned above um, really are laying the foundation for there not being a better time to be in AI overall. If you're in, if you're in business, um, or you're an entrepreneur, or you're in government, um, you know, this should both excite you and maybe scare you a bit at the same time. Um, because what we've seen coming out, of the, coming out of the pandemic is this idea of a K-shaped recovery. And that is where companies were able to gain momentum um, and start to uh, grow and improve coming out of the recovery, went on an upward tra trajectory, and were able to continue to drive that. And then companies that didn't, um, you know, went the other direction, unfortunately. We're seeing the same thing in AI, where companies who are making that investment now are building products that get them more data, that get them more opportunity, that get them more users, that allow them to attract more talent, that, can, that build this flywheel of, of improvement. And the companies that aren't are going to quickly hit a point where they fall behind. And so if you're in business, if you're, um, if you're looking at policy, these are things that you need to think about uh, as we head forward, as we drive forward into the, the economy of the, of the future and an AI-driven economy. Now, as uh, scary and maybe a little bit exciting as that sounds, the reason that, or one of the big reasons that there really is no better time to be in AI overall is the, we're at this wonderful place where the tooling um, and the, the, the things that you can build off of um, are, are at a place where you don't have to start everything from scratch. You don't have to have an army of PhDs uh, to, to start your, your machine learning journey. So here's just you know, less than, um, you know, you know, le over the last decade, um, three open source uh, projects and three um, tools that people are able to leverage to be able to, to build in, in AI. And so PyTorch, which is you know, the, probably the most popular uh, deep learning library in the world, Scikit-learn, which has been a Python library for machine learning for a long time now, um, and the recent growth of things like Hugging Face, where you're able to download and leverage existing models. Um, it's just been a short amount of time um, that all of these have, have ramped up. Um, and they have been tools that now instead of something that you would have to build from scratch and you'd have to learn how to run a GPU and get all this from, and build on all of that from scratch, you're able to, to build off what exists now. At the same time, 
when we talk about large models and we talk about the amount of compute and the amount of data um, that, that it takes to create some of these, uh, we're also seeing either open source version or plat versions or platforms that are able to be built on top of so you can leverage the foundation models, you can leverage and stand on the shoulders of companies who have already trained and already built these things for you. So just, this is less than three years old where AlphaFold um, you know, was, was released in early 2021 and we've seen uh, the use and the, abs the very rapid growth of that in biology, we've seen the rapid growth of that um, as, uh, as people in drug discovery and, bio and, um, and the life sciences are using it to drive forward new discoveries. They don't have to train that from scratch, they can build off what exists. Um, and of course, what probably everybody's heard a little bit about is ChatGPT, large language models. Uh, you're gonna hear uh, Finbar talk about it later today and on Thursday, um, but the rapid rise of large language models that are trained, that you can build on top of and apply in your context, you don't have to do from scratch. So both the frameworks and the data and trained models um, that you're able to, to leverage are at a point in time where you're able to derive real business value, you're able to have impact in the area that you want to have um, very rapidly. At the same time, the rate of, of discovery in the space is not stopping and it's not slowing down. Um, this is uh, now a couple years old, but the total accepted papers at the NeurIPS conference, so one of, you know, maybe the most popular machine learning conference, um, you know, is just seeing this absolute exponential growth in the number of papers, the amount of research done. And so for those who are investing in machine learning now, they're able to take advantage of not just the tools and stuff that exist, but the ongoing growing research that is, uh, that's being done around the world uh, and being published. So this is, uh, this is from a couple years ago, and that graph is somewhere way north of that um, this last year. I forget what the final number is, but it's, it's huge. Um, so this is, this is this great opportunity to be able to both leverage existing tools, drive real value, drive real um, opportunity and solve meaningful problems using machine learning at the same time leverage all the awesome things that, are, that continue to come. And so with that, I'll give you what my actual prediction uh, for the future of AI is. And that is that understanding is the future of AI. We're at a point in the field where there's a lot of questions that need to be answered from basic scientific questions, understanding intelligence, understanding um, the, the uh, systems that we're deploying through to understanding the impact that this is going to have on the, on the world and how do we have the most positive impact overall? And the answer is that like, you know, this week we're gonna have a whole bunch of different uh, thoughts, ideas, proposals for what direction those are going to go. And if we want to have this be the most positive, the most impactful technology that we can, we need to drive forward understanding. And that is the only way that we're going to get to that positive future. And this is everything from a global understanding of AI, this, where we have this technology, if it's touching everyone, everyone should understand it and broad-based AI literacy is extremely important and broad-based understanding of AI is extremely important. We're heading into a time where we're discussing regulation and policy. We can't have discussions like this uh, where, has anybody seen you know, uh, when Facebook and Google went in front of Congress? We can't, have our, we can't have discussions that way where you know, it was essentially a whole bunch of people um, asking how to turn their phone on um, and why, you know, the, asking the Google CEO why the Facebook app wasn't working for them, the Facebook CEO whether it connects to the internet. These are not the conversations that we can be having around AI. And the only way that we can, we can raise the level of discussion is by raising the level of understanding. For those, if you're an executive, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a business leader, this is, a, this is the most important time for you to figure out 
this technology and to understand it and understand where it's going to have an impact in your business. If you're a student, if you're an employee hitting the workforce right now or going to be hitting the workforce in the, in the near future, understanding how this tool is going to affect your job, how it's going to affect um, and improve what you can do going forward. And for those of you who are in the, in the research sphere, whether you're a, a, a student, whether you're an early career researcher, um, understanding uh, the science of AI has never been more important. And there's never been a more important time to double down on the fundamentals and the fundamental science of AI. It might seem really scary looking as a researcher where there's more papers published in your tiny area at NeurIPS than used to be published at NeurIPS overall. But the exciting part about that is that it's driving even more of a community, even more colleagues, more people to be able to, be able to have a discussion and to be able to understand and collaborate with to drive what the, what the future of this field is going to be. And so we have this tool, we have this opportunity where AI is going to play a significant role in creating a positive future for all of us if we let it. If we put ourselves in a position to be able to tackle some of the largest problems that we have in the world right now, um, you know, it's clear skies today, which is nice. Hopefully that continues this week. Um, but we're seeing unprecedented wildfires. You know, we just got through or, or kind of through a pandemic, rising healthcare costs, you know, energy and, and food security. These are all big world problems and we have the opportunity to leverage perhaps the most important tool and discoveries of all time to be able to tackle those. And there, we're going to hit challenges and hit, um, hit things that we need to, need to improve or need to fix along the way but we shouldn't dismiss that and we shouldn't let that hold us back because we have the biggest opportunity to be able to, to tackle these challenges using AI going forward and understanding is the way that we're going to get there. So what is actually next? There's this uh, saying that the, the best way to predict the future is to create it and we get to create the future that we want. There's never been a better time to build and to create in AI, and we talk about this, and our mission at Amy is AI for good and for all. And we get to decide as a group, as a community, and as a society, how we make that future for good and for all. And so the future of AI is understanding, and to me, the future of AI is what this week is all about. It's about bringing together people at every level, whether it's the first time you've heard about AI, whether you're like some of our researchers who have been researching in this area since before I was born, whether you're driving policy decisions, whether you're driving business decisions, or whether you're trying to understand the foundations of what we're doing here, we get to do this all together. And so at Amy, we like to talk about and live three values which is being ambitious, authentic, and approachable. I hope this week all of you will live those and embrace those with us where we can have ambitious conversations with each other. We can drive ambitious research agendas uh, and ambitious policy agendas going forward. Everyone can be their authentic self and bring their authentic self to those conversations because we need every voice in the discussion in order for this to get where it needs to go. And we hope that everybody is approachable um, and, uh, and really seeks to understand uh, what, what their colleagues are and what each other are doing here and what each other are bringing to the table this week. I'm gonna reiterate, there's no better time to build an AI and there's no more exciting time to be an AI. And we're excited to be able to have all of you here this week and drive that out together. Thank you. Um, 
I, w I did say I wasn't going to do Q&A, but I also ended early. So why don't we do, uh, we'll, ha we'll have time for a couple questions. Awesome. Awesome. For folks that are wanting to ask questions, you can either put your hand up and someone will run a mic to you, or you are on the edge, you can come to a standing mic. If you yell, I'll repeat it. Yeah. I just want to thank you for organizing this conference and for doing what you're doing. Um, so I'm 70 years old, I've been around and always thinking about stuff in the future, and I think a conference like this brings people together who have a common interest and brings you to the cutting edge, the state of the art. So I would encourage everyone not to feel insecure about your thoughts, but to be very bold when you come out of this. So congratulations. Well, thank you. Um, just to repeat, um, sorry, I'm not, I don't know your name, but um, I want to encourage everybody to be ambitious this week, be bold, bring your thoughts, and also want to say thanks to all the, the Amy team and everybody who worked so hard to, to bring this together. Softball question to start. Awesome. Oh. Mr. Lemke, um, I work with people in the largest occupation in North America. One in nine works in sales revenue production. AI pretends or is going to have a major impact on those people for employment and for revenue production. And I'm asking for help. Is anybody here working on helping me take AI? And for instance, if you have to make a sales call, a technical sales call, and you have AI working in your glasses that gives you the right words to say to close a sale, et cetera, okay? Anybody working in this area, would I'd really appreciate being in touch with them. And what are your thoughts on that large employment area and what's gonna happen? Um, yeah, so thank you. Um, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm sure there are, there are many people who are, who are working in the area. Um, you know, there's a company here in town, Scope AR, that's doing really cool things in the, in the augmented reality space. Um, certainly, we're seeing a ton of, uh, of opportunity, a ton of increase. Uh, between the, the collaboration of, of humans and AI and the opportunities around that, and you know, we really see this, and I really see this as an as a augmentation where we're able to improve uh, and, and grow what people are doing. Um, in Canada, we have a productivity challenge. Uh, we really need to improve our, our productivity. Um, in, in almost every industry. So uh, the ability to leverage AI to do that is really important. Any other questions? Last question, most important question. Morning. Morning. Um, uh, you said that AI literacy would be very critical in, in yeah. this uh, space. So how can we encourage our SMEs specifically, 98% of whom are in Edmonton, how can we encourage them to adopt AI in their operations? Awesome. Well, um, this is going to be a tough one to not overly speak my own book on this one. Uh, you know, Amy, we actually do a lot um, in that area. Um, you know, one of the first things is just understanding <laughs> And I know I keep saying that, uh, but just like, what is machine learning? What is not machine learning? Where can it be? A, where can it be deployed? What do I need to be successful in the area? So part of it is just demystifying some of the you know, like kind of scary pieces of that. And we run a number of of courses to do that. And I do think that just widespread understanding is one big piece. Um, and then the second part is looking at where. Um, looking at where it can be deployed that actually drives business value. And that's what every SME, that's what every small business owner or medium-sized business owner is looking for, is like how, whether it's a place that can improve costs, can I drive a new revenue line, uh, where is it going to have a meaningful impact in what I do? And if we can start with companies understanding that uh, and understanding where it can be deployed, um, that allows us to move into a place where um, we can actually, they can actually evaluate evaluate the uh, the business opportunity there. But it is one thing I would encourage every every SME, every entrepreneur, um, there kind of is like, there's no choice in, in this in a sense. Like AI is going to every industry. And so now is the best possible opportunity to dive in to understand how it's going to affect yours and where you can leverage it um, to drive great business value going forward. So 
you know, I, I, unfortunately, uh, the answer is, uh, is you know, not that exciting, but it really does come back to understanding overall. Thanks. All right. Well, I hope everybody has a great, ambitious week. Thank you for coming out to, to uh, start this morning. Um, one quick favor, because I feel like um, maybe this didn't get mentioned. Um, for those who are wondering, we're not at a hockey game. And so the garbage that you leave at the seats stays there. So please take your garbage with you <laughs> on the way out. It'll do our, our staff and our, our team here a huge favor as we continue to turn over the, the rooms um, and allow us to keep the, the place as tidy as possible uh, for the week. But thank you, everyone. And we're really, really excited for this week and what we're gonna what we're gonna learn and do together. Thanks. Thank you.